Welcome to our study on the armor of God from Adirondack Baptist Church. In this series, Pastor Matt explains Ephesians 6 and how Paul instructs each believer to fight against the schemes of the evil one. Thank you for joining me again as we make our way through the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. This pandemic has really taken its toll on a number of people. According to one CDC study, about 40% of U.S. adults 18 or older reported struggling with substance abuse or some sort of mental health issue. According to their data, around 31% of adults around 18 or higher struggled with depression or anxiety during this time, and 13% started or increased their substance abuse. People during this pandemic have become down and despairing and depressed. Ultimately, what we see in society is a hopelessness. Now, it didn't take a pandemic necessarily for us to know that because all of human society, without Christ, exists in a state of hopelessness. What about you? It's easy to label other people as hopeless, but are you someone who is despairing or depressed or hopeless? Do you live a life filled with no hope in this world? Do you find yourself dwelling on all the wrong in the world, or rehearse in your mind all the evil that has been done to you? Perhaps you can't remember the last day that you woke up excited because you were awake and alive in God's world. And as we make our way through the armor of God, Paul now addresses two specific pieces of armor that you and I as Christians are to grasp or take up. Paul, in Ephesians 6.17, says this, And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Today, what I want to do is focus your attention on that first piece of armor that you were called to grasp or take up, and that is the helmet of salvation. This helmet, as you will soon see, relates specifically to the devil's scheme of driving people into despair or hopelessness. The devil loves to thrust people into the throes of despair and and depression. And in the book of Ephesians, which we've been examining, Paul says that the devil has launched unbelievers into a world of hopelessness. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, unbelievers are completely controlled by the devil. They are children of wrath and have no escape from their sinful lifestyle. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 12, Paul says that unbelievers who were outside of Israel at the time were in a state of hopelessness. He says this, But at the time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Basically, what Paul is saying is that anyone outside of Jesus is without hope. William Gurnall, who wrote a book called The Christian in Complete Armor, says this, Christless and hopeless are joined together in that passage. Those without Christ do not have the promise of a future, don't have the promise of a God who is near, of a Savior who forgives, and a God who accepts and loves them. There is no hope. The state of an unbeliever really is that state of hopelessness. And if you're listening to this, and you're somebody who has never come to Jesus, that is your state. You stand condemned under the wrath of God, and you are alienated from Him, His love, and His saving promises. But as a Christian, do you live a life without hope? Maybe you go about your day to work or the grocery store or home or out to dinner and you're down, despairing, and depressed. And you never think things are going to get better. Well, I want to say to you that Paul does address this issue of despair and hopelessness. And he does this by providing this first piece of armor that we were to put on in this section. He says we were to take up against hopelessness and against these schemes of the devil, the helmet of salvation. So what is the helmet of salvation, and how does it relate to hopelessness? Well, in Roman times, a soldier would wear a large helmet during battle. The helmet protected everything above his neck, his his nose, his eyes, his cheeks, even his shoulders, and it was complete coverage and complete protection for the soldier. Likewise, the helmet of salvation guards our thinking about the world around us. It keeps us from believing lies or being led into despair and looking at the world without Christ at the forefront. This helmet guards our thinking, and the helmet is salvation. 
The term salvation is thrown quite a bit in Christian circles, but what exactly does it mean? Really, salvation, the term, is an umbrella term. It, it captures a lot of different ideas. It's used to describe and include all, the, all of God's purposes in rescuing his people and bringing sin to an end. The concept is discussed at least four or five times in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.3, we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, brings salvation. In Ephesians 2.5 and, and 2.8, uh, salvation is associated with God raising a believer out of his sinful, hopeless state because of his union with Christ. He raises us up with Christ and gives us a heavenly position. In Ephesians 5, verse 23, we see that Christ gave himself to the church as its savior. And likewise, husbands are to give themselves to their wives. And then finally, we have salvation listed in our text today. So, when Paul uses the term salvation, he's referring to everything that God does to save you. He forgives your sins, he adopts you, he chooses you, he gives you an inheritance, he gives you new life, promises eternity in the new heaven, new earth, will right every wrong, and I'm sure I forgot a list of things. But this term isn't just used in a vacuum. Paul likely is thinking of its use in Isaiah 59, verses 17 through 20. And here's what Isaiah 59, 17 says. I actually referenced this, I believe, earlier in our series. Verse 17 says that he, or the Messiah, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. It says here that the Messiah, the conqueror, the King Jesus, put on a helmet of salvation. And here we see Jesus bringing salvation. And in the context, it refers to deliverance of his people from the oppressors, from enemies. It's when God delivers his people from evil and their enemies. Well, what does this have to do with hope? Using the same helmet terminology, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 actually makes a direct link between the helmet of salvation and a believer's hope. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8 through 9, Paul says this, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what Paul does. He ties together the concept of this helmet of salvation with hope. Salvation produces hope. In context of Thessalonians, this hope refers to the day of the Lord when he will come and right all wrongs and justify believers, bringing them into a glorified body and a new heaven and a new earth. So let's try to tie everything together. What is salvation and how does it deal with our hopelessness? Well, salvation, according to Scripture, as I said before, includes all these things. Forgiveness, justification, punishment of the wicked, adoption, election, redemption, cleansing, and a whole slew of God's saving benefits. And this is all done through Jesus. When you place your faith and turn to him in repentance, in him, you are linked to Jesus, to his death, his burial, and resurrection. You are united with him, and all of the saving benefits of God in Christ are yours. So how does your salvation bring you hope? Well, Paul links the concept of salvation and hope three times in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul prays that believers come to fully grasp the hope of God's calling. He says, God has called you, God wants you, and there's great hope that comes along with that. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul says that unbelievers are without hope, which implies that we as Christians, that you as a believer, have hope in this world in the promises of God. Finally, in Ephesians 4, verse 4, Paul says that you and I as Christians share a specific hope with one another. Simply stated, hope is a settled confidence in the promises of God. You know that God will come through on his word. For the unbelievers listening, I said that your current state is one of hopelessness. But it doesn't have to stay that way. It actually can change. Hope for salvation is found by turning to Jesus by placing your faith in him, in his death, burial, resurrection, turning to him in repentance, making him your Lord. By placing your faith in Jesus, you too can share in the hope that every believer has. You as a Christian, though, should be most hopeful by comparison. Compared to all unbelievers, we as Christians are the only ones with real hope. William Gurnall, again in his book, 
says true hope is a jewel that none wears but Christ's bride, a grace with which none is graced but the believer's soul. You as a Christian should be most hopeful. So, hope belongs to us as believers. Maybe you're ill or you're sick and you're tempted to be despairing because of your condition. But you know what? Have hope that one day you will receive a brand new body and live with God forever. When you're lonely or rejected, don't let your very real sadness turn into depression or despair. You are adopted and chosen by the God of the universe. You are special to Him. When you are in need of money or work or physical needs, don't be anxious, but rest knowing that your God provides and cares. One of the major differences between believers and unbelievers is their hope. Unbelievers have none, whereas you as a Christian have a certain hope in God through Jesus. You as a Christian have an amazing salvation like none other. So, in order to stand against the schemes of the devil, particularly this scheme of dragging people to despair, hope in the God of your salvation. Thank you for joining me today. Tune in next week as we talk about the sword of the Spirit. Until next time, I hope you have a good week. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about our church and what it means to be saved, please check out our website at adirondackbaptist.com or visit our Facebook page. We love to hear from you.